This lesson is like the nuclear chemistry lesson in that it's a, really an exposure lesson. There is really only a little bit of information that I think is essential, and the rest of it is kind of if you're interested in it. Um, it's a really good one for kind of sparking the interest of students and doing like a student research project. But in terms of just straight up lecture going through, it's quite boring. So um, the next slide, I'm going to give you basically kind of my summary of what I think is the most important stuff out of groups for the periodic table. And then I'm going to go through the rest of my slides. And you can choose to go through them or not. That's up to you. Um, if you want to kind of hear some interesting things about different elements, go for it. If not, you know, then just stop after this summary. But the summary here is the key essential things you need to know. So, for example, hydrogen is its own group. Hydrogen is unique amongst all of the elements. Um, if there's going to be an exception to one of the rules of chemistry, it's going to be hydrogen, which we will see many times coming forward. It is the most common element in the universe. That's what you need to know about hydrogen. Okay, group one. These are your alkali metals. They are soft. And when I say soft, I mean you can cut them with a butter knife. Um... But you got to be careful with them because they are extremely highly reactive with water and air. Um, meaning that this is the kind of stuff you've seen people throw in pools that explodes. What's going on there is that the reaction produces a lot of hydrogen when it's exposed to water specifically. It gives off a lot of hydrogen, but it's also giving off so much energy that it causes that hydrogen to ignite immediately. And that's why you're going to see flame or an explosion going on when you deal with alkaline metals. Um, I've used this stuff before. I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, I find the safety risks outweigh the benefits of the coolness factor. Um, there's plenty of cool YouTube videos out there. Um, I've, I've blown up a beaker um, doing this. Um, not on purpose. Um, and so, yeah. So when I want to show a reaction, I use alkaline earth, which is group two. Calcium does an amazing job when you drop it in water of bumping around and fizzing, making hydrogen gas. And sometimes you can use a lighter or something and you can actually ignite that hydrogen gas. Um, you can kind of get the same effect, but in a much less reactive way. Magnesium does the same thing if you, as long as you clean it with some steel wool first, because uh, it oxidizes pretty quickly. Right, so that's really all you need to know about group two, alkaline earth, is that they're like the alkaline metals, just not quite as crazy. All right, group 14. Notice I skipped a whole bunch of groups. Um, that's because either A, they're just not as critically important to kind of chemistry in general or our usage, or their properties are just not all that interesting. All right, um, carbon group. This is carbon and silicon. Um, by the way, it's silicon, it's not silicone. Uh, silicone is a plastic. Silicon is the element. <laughs> Alright, so it can form four bonds, and this is the basis of life. Um, nothing else can form four bonds like carbon and silicon, um, and even lead at the bottom of the group. But it is really only carbon that is the basis of life because of its size. Uh, silicon can do a little bit of the long chains, but not very long. Uh, nothing compares to the long carbon chains that carbon can form. Then the flexibility that this gives carbon is what makes it the basis of life because it is the most flexible element in terms of how it can bond, um, which is critical. All right, group 16 are known as the chalcogens. The name literally means chalk formers. Okay, um, this is oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium. They all smell, form smelly compounds. For example, if you've ever been around water that has sulfur in it, it smells like rotten eggs. That rotten egg smells a sulfur compound. You smell it sometimes with matches or other things. You can smell that smelliness. Same thing for uh, lightning bolts. Um, or after a lightning storm, sometimes there's a pungent odor. If you're really near um, something that has like a, if you short a circuit, there usually be a strong pungent odor right after that. Um, and that's ozone. That's actually a form of oxygen, O3. Um, and it's smelly, and it's not fun. All right. Group 17 are the halogens. These are your salt formers. Uh, they form salts with group 1. They're highly reactive. 
um, almost as highly reactive as the alkaline metals. Uh, they're highly toxic um, and they're used as disinfectants because of that toxicity. Um, chlorine in its natural gas form is, is very dangerous, but you dilute it down and all of a sudden you get something that cleans pools. Iodine in pure form can be very dangerous, but can be used to clean cuts when it's in a solution. That kind of thing. All right, group 18. Um, these are your noble gases. This is helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. These gases are totally non-reactive. Uh, basically, scientists had to force them to form compounds. And that didn't even happen until, I believe, the 20s or 40s. Um, it's further on in the slides. I've got the exact date. But, you know, they just don't react. They don't form compounds. They just do their own thing. Um, main use for them is they're used in neon lights, which are becoming less and less common as LED, LEDs kind of take over. But um, different noble gases would create different colors in a neon light. So, like, I know the red is neon, um, and I don't remember which one the other ones are. And then the final group we're going to look at are the coinage metals. That's group 11, copper, silver, and gold. Uh, they resist corrosion. That's why they're used in coins. Um, they can corrode, but nothing like, think about iron. You know, if, I, if we had iron coins, how fast would they rust in our pockets or in our piggy banks? Um, in contrast to that, copper, silver, and gold are very resistant to corrosion, specifically gold. Gold does not get much of a coating or a patina on it like copper and silver do. You don't have to polish gold quite so much. Um, but silver still can oxidize a little bit, but very slowly. And then all three of them are great conductors. We use copper for our wiring. Um, not because it's the best conductor of the three, but because it's the cheapest of the three. Uh, silver actually conducts better, and gold is the best conductor. Um, but gold wire in your house is a little expensive. Um, so we don't use gold for wiring. Um, NASA does for satellites, um, for some of their wiring, I believe, um, but not, not us normal folks. So like I was saying, this is the crux of everything you need to know and the most important things you need to know about the element groups. And so the rest of these slides, I'm going to go into more detail. And like I said, if I was teaching this, I would just have my students, I would assign groups to my students and make them do research on them. Um, but we will go through the rest of it right now. All right, so hydrogen. Hydrogen, like I said, not doesn't act like any other element. Most abundant in the universe. And it's a fuel for the sun of other stars. And it also, you know, good old hydrogen fuel cells in cars. Um, we use it in organic compounds. Things which, not all organic compounds are things which used to be alive or are alive. But for most part, that's how we think about them. But oil and natural gas or carbon are, have a lot of hydrogen in them. Um, and it's primarily used, and our primary use for it today, as opposed to, you know, just hydrogen fuel cells, is the making of ammonia. Um, you take nitrogen and, and hydrogen and you react them with a catalyst and you will get ammonia, which we use for fertilizer. All right, group one alkalis. Like I said, they're, they have the basic metallics, even though they're soft. They're still shiny, they're still malleable, they're still ductile, they're still good conductors if you keep them in safe conditions. Um, like I said, you can cut them with a butter knife. Even soft, I mean, like if you've been around like lead or gold, that, they, they still are so much softer than even those. And they're highly reactive. Here's where the hydrogen's catching on fire. <laughs> um, so they're always stored under oil or kerosene to kind of keep them from reacting with water or air. And they form salts with group 17, the halogens. All right, alkaline metals are never found in their pure form because of they're so reactive. Um, however, sodium and potassium are incredibly common. You know, table salt is sodium chloride. Um, it's important to know that when things undergo chemical changes and form chemical bonds, their properties change. Sodium by itself is highly reactive with water, but yet salt is not even though it has sodium in it, okay? So when the sodium chemically combines to form salt, it forms what's called a sodium ion, its properties completely and totally change. All right, it's also a common product in table salt, like I said, lye, bleach, and baking soda. 
All right, alkali inerts. Um, they derive their name because they are similar to alkalis, uh, but much less reactive. Also, rarely found in their pure form. Of the group, calcium is probably the most common. It's found in limestone, marble, chalk, and seashells. Like seashells and limestone are calcium carbonate. I believe, or is that marble? I always get it mixed up. No, yeah, so limestone and marble are the same type of rock. Limestone being the sedimentary rock, marble being the metamorphic. Um, and so they're all kind of related chemically speaking. All right, then magnesium is used in mag wheels and mag tools and also used to strengthen alloys in airplanes. All right, so I did add the extra here for the boron group. Um, most important one here is aluminum. This is one of those things I just find interesting that until the late 1800s, aluminum was considered a precious metal because they could not extract it from the ore that it was in. And then somehow in the late 1800s, they finally found an inexpensive way to remove aluminum from its ore. And good old supply and demand, all of a sudden the supply of aluminum went way up. And the demand and the price, therefore, went down. I mean, here's some ladies, you know, Victorian era um, aluminum necklace, which is no longer worth much squat other than as an antique. The metal itself is not worth much. Um, aluminum is highly resistant to corrosion because it forms a natural layer of aluminum oxide on the outside that protects it. Um, that's why aluminum foil lasts forever. Okay, um, It's relatively soft unless you combine it with something else. All right. aluminum, no, that's why it's used in cans, pots, foils, that's a All right, carbon group. Very versatile due to its ability to form four bonds. Carbon is by far the most important. Um, like I've said before, it is the foundation of, um, like I said, limestone is calcium carbon eight. Um, a lot of rocks are carbonates. Um, so that's a very common in a lot of rocks. Uh, fossil fuels are made of a carbon backbone. And then all living things, we are carbon based living organisms. So carbon is by far the most important. All right. So carbon, and this is a good time to talk about allotropes. An allotrope is a different physical form of an element that's still chemically the same thing. So, for example, diamond, graphite, and amorphous carbon, these three. Diamond, graphite, and amorphous carbon are all forms of carbon, but they all are very, very different. Um, this is very brittle. Um, this is kind of like a chunk of coal. You could probably crush it in your hand. Graphite is really strong in uh, this way. Um, that's why they use it in like tennis rackets and in golf clubs and stuff that it can flex and move along the plane really well. But you can also shear it through here. See, there's no bonds connecting these layers. So it is brittle in that direction. You can shear it and, and crack it. As opposed, diamond has this very strong three-dimensional lattice structure that is incredibly strong. Um, then a lot of these other ones are man-made. Uh, Buckminster fullerene, fullerite, carbon nanotubes, these things are man-made. Um, and they are really the future of materials in construction. Uh, carbon nanotubes are stronger than steel. But yet, I mean, think about that's atoms. And so incredibly thin. That is way, way, way thinner than a strand of hair. But stronger than a steel wire. Um, and so these are really revolutionizing how we do things. These and these make amazing lubricants and make things move and flow smoothly because they're small balls that roll over each other really easily. And so they're revolutionizing the future of materials and construction. All right. Um, and then carbon dioxide is used to carbonate things and in fire extinguishers. And then we also have good old dry ice. All right, another important member of this group is silicon. Uh, silicon is found in rocks, um, silicates, sand, and then therefore glass. Uh, glass is primarily silicon dioxide. And then um, used in semiconductors and transistors and microchips and solar cells. A lot of our electronics have silicon in them. All right, the nitrogen group. Um, I also didn't give you anything out here because it's just not, chemically speaking, it's not an amazing group. Um, the most important one by far is nitrogen. Um, atmospheric nitrogen is N2, 
and it is so unreactive that it's it's amazing it's almost up there with noble gases in terms of it is just it doesn't want to react with anything which is good because you know it's good that our atmosphere is unreactive you know it keeps things from corroding keeps things from reacting in our hands keeps our bodies from reacting um, but in this form it is useless to plants and animals and so we have to fix it is what they call it by turning it in either to into ammonia or a nitrate um, and there are plants like clovers and beans who have bacteria in their roots that help to turn atmospheric nitrogen into a usable form of nitrogen and then also um, lightning bolts do that as well and then once again nitrogen its main use like hydrogen is to make ammonia for fertilizer and other nitrogen containing compounds the amusing thing here to me or the ironic thing so like I said into nitrogen totally unreactive however things like nitroglycerin and TNT which is tri nitro toluene make explosives nitrogen is a common element in explosives which I find so ironic that in its natural form it's so unreactive and doesn't do anything but once we get it to bond with things it tends to go boom um, ammonia was used to help make the Oklahoma City bombing in wait that was the 90s or around 2000 um, no it would have been 90s um, that we had the Oklahoma City bombing Timothy McVeigh ammonia and diesel fuel um, and so even then it was explosive in that form All right group 16 like I said these are the chalkogens which means chalk formers uh, they're known for their smelly compounds um, oxygen is the most common element in this group and on earth because um, it makes up most of the rocks um, like we talked about carbonates and silicates and that kind of stuff well the eight part there is three oxygens hanging on the end three or four and so it's incredibly common in rocks so it is part of every single thing in that picture there's oxygen in that tree there's oxygen in the water oxygen in the rock oxygen in the air it's everywhere okay um, required for combustion and respiration key thing here for the combustion part oxygen is not flammable okay you can't have fire without oxygen but oxygen is not the thing doing the burning the fuel is doing the burning the oxygen is essential but when I light a match on fire it's not the oxygen in the air that's burning it's the match that's burning otherwise when I if, if oxygen was flammable when I struck a match 20% of the air in the room would all of a sudden catch on fire and that would be bad <laughs> you know so oxygen is required for fire if you take away the oxygen fire goes out if you add more oxygen the fire tends to burn hotter and faster that's why blacksmiths use those billows they're pushing air and more oxygen through the fire to help the fire burn better burn faster burn hotter um, and so oxygen is required but itself is not that way all right uh, another form of oxygen is ozone toxic pungent gas considered an air pollutant um, it's formed at least in low atmosphere by electric discharges like a lightning bolt um, it's formed in the upper atmosphere by cosmic radiation hitting oxygen atoms um, O2 molecules up in the upper atmosphere causing them to form ozone and it creates a protective layer that protects us from UV rays all right continuing on another important member of this group is sulfur uh, naturally occurs around volcanic vents you see the yellow stuff on the ground here um, its main use is in making sulfuric acid um, sulfuric acid is in a, one of the most common industrial chemicals um, it is used to make so many things um, as you can see detergents paints plastics insecticides explosives lots of different things come from sulfuric acid all right halogens salt formers um, they are highly reactive due to high electron affinity which we'll get to later basically they want to grab electrons and so they will take them from other things um, and makes them highly reactive all of them are toxic uh, that's why they're used in disinfectants in low concentrations uh, the main one is how it is chlorine 
which is used in pools. Sometimes bromine is used in pools as well and in the medical field. All right, noble gases. They're in their name because they're not reactive. So it's 1962 when they made their first compound. I believe it's xenon hexafluoride. Uh, XEF6 uh, was the first compound made with a noble gas. All right, uh, most important one or most common one is argon. Makes up a full 1% of our atmosphere. They're using the neon lights. All right, transition metals. They have a wide variety of uses. This is group 3 through 12, the D block. Um, they vary greatly in their physical properties, their abundance. Some of them are super dense. Others have high melting points like tungsten. Uh, that's why tungsten, one of its original use, not original, but one of its historical uses was filaments for light bulbs because it won't melt. Um, and so it can withstand the heat generated by the light bulb without melting. All right. So they do have similar properties within their groups. Uh, and some of them are more important than others. Okay, so just some important ones in general. So chromium, chromium is very resistant to corrosion. That's why it's used to make chrome. So a coating on stainless steel, you add a little bit of it uh, to steel and you get chrome. I mean, I think it's a little bit. It's like under 3% if I remember correctly. All right, um, its name comes from the word color, chromos. Um, and that's because it forms a compound with a wide variety of colors. Like this yellow here is called chromium yellow, uh, but it can also form reds and greens and purples. All right, iron. One of the most abundant metals on the entire planet, used in a lot of alloys and like steel is an alloy of carbon. With carbon, once again, just a few percentage points of carbon. Um, big problem is it rust. That's one of its problems. That's why we have stainless steel. Um, it's also used in hemoglobin in your blood. Uh, the heme group in the center has a hydrogen in it. And that is part of what gives the blood its red color. Okay. All right, coinage metals found in group 11. They are often found in their pure form because they're risen to corrosion. They are relatively soft and generally tend to be combined with other things. We get brass and bronze and sterling silver. Uh, 14 karat gold, 10 karat gold, white gold, and the such. Okay. Um, copper of the group is the only one that is known to somewhat corrode, and it's not really corrosion. It's It gets a patina. We call it a patina um, of copper oxide on the outside, um, which forms this green on statues. Um, could either be copper or um, bronze. Tends to do this as well. Uh, the Statue of Liberty is made out of copper. And has this lovely patina over the entire thing. All right, inner transition metals, that's your F block. Um, the F block are all pretty similar. Um, they tend to be too reactive to be used, but they're used commonly in a bunch of uh, alloys, special ceramics, glass. Uh, they're being used a lot more in like smart technology, um, small magnets, and that kind of stuff. Um, are related to the lanthanides here, group uh, 4F, sorry, period 4F. All right, the actinides, they're in 5F, they're all radioactive, but the big thing about them is only two of them occur in nature. The rest of them are all man-made. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of uses for them because they tend to react too quickly. So that's all of your elements. Um, and so, like I said, go back to that summary chart at the very beginning, and that'll give you the key facts you need to know. Um, with that, I'll see you in the next video.